picture there, of course, is in Israel across the Red Sea. We're going to study a passage in 1 Corinthians 10. But you know, before Paul wrote that passage, I don't think anybody would have ever seen what Paul saw in this, what God showed or what Jesus showed Paul in that experience of Israel, what he writes is we're going to, we're going to look at. But it was, it was prefiguring an, an event in the New Testament, the baptism of the believer, with their minister watching on and Christ leading them from above. And that's what, that's what Paul brings out, and that's what we're going to study. And of course, that's its connection there with the communion service. Communion itself, the word actually, the biblical word means to partake of something with another to participate with others or to associate or have fellowship with another. In fact, in the New Testament, the word for fellowship or communion almost always is the same Greek word. So when we partake of the ordinance of communion, with whom are we fellowshipping or communing with? Apart from, of course, with each other. Who else are we communing with? Of course, it's with Jesus. We're told in the Desire of Ages that Christ is there at every service by his Spirit to set his seal upon his own ordinance. And that's something we really need to understand and believe when we partake of the communion service that Christ is there personally. That service, of course, it strengthens and blesses the individual who partakes and, of course, the body of believers, the whole church. In fact, Jesus instituted the ordinances of foot washing and communion service at a time when the body of believers, the disciples, were... Uh, divided and actually in fact there was a quite a crisis that evening the foot and and that's why and that brought about that unity among them at least among 11 of them the foot washing itself which comes before the, the partaking of the bread and the wine that teaches humility and service and the communion service itself the emblems there is no teaching or ordinance in all the Bible or in all the New Testament that brings more power or more unity to the church. And that's why Christ instituted it. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's read verse 16. This is the purpose of the communion service, what it's supposed to bring about to the believers. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Notice, friends, what the Bible says. When you partake of the bread and the wine, each individual but together as one, you're partaking of what? The life of Christ, the very body of Christ. And what does that do for the church? Look at verse 17. For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Notice now with me how powerful this, this service is, or is supposed to be. The life of Christ is to be lived out in each individual member. Imagine if that was, that will happen too. That happened in, at, at Pentecost and the early Christian church and it's going to happen again in the latter rainfalls, or before the latter rainfalls. But you can imagine if everyone partaking of that communion service, they know they're partaking of the very life of Christ. In other words, they are living for him and receiving more of his life. And that's bringing them, each individual, closer together. And, and that whole church represents the life of Christ. Imagine the, how explosive, how powerful that is to the world, all around the world, the individual believers. The communion service was, when truly realised, will bring about the life of Christ in every individual and, of course, in the unity of the church. And that's what exactly what Ephesians 4.13 says. Do we come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man? How perfect? Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The very fullness of Christ will be realised in the church, united. Now, the opposite to that also is true. 
if there are divisions or disputes, differences in the church, you can be certain that that means that individually members are not partaking of Christ's life. And the communion service has totally lost its significance and its power. The power is there, but it's not realised because individuals are not surrendering, not receiving of his life. They're not really eating of his bread and drinking of, of, his, and drinking of his blood. In other words, receiving more of his life. Therefore, the communion service becomes just an outward form or a ceremony, which basically is what it is. Sunday churches forget it. That's exactly what it is. And Adventism is no different. I don't want to belittle those who are truly faithful, but in general, that's the case. The reality of it is, because you don't see that explosion in the church that was there in the early Christian church, and that's the reality of it. The communion service has lost its power. During the Reformation, this was one of the biggest most important um, controversies, the communion service. Many people lost their lives to hold that, that true ordinance, make it, make it real and available to us. But it lost its power, and that's exactly what was happening to the church in Corinth. Paul makes this very point with them. Look, come to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's read verse 9. Before he addresses the issues that were in the divisions in the church, he tells them, when they're fellowshipping with Christ, what that really should bring about in the church. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now if we're all called to the fellowship of, of, of Christ, or partaking of Christ, what would that bring to the church? Let's read the next verse. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, if you're fellowshiping with, with his son, Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, and that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And we individually have fellowship with Jesus Christ, we'll be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. Because it's his mind, it's his life. How can we be different? This is impossible. And this is beautiful to look forward to. And... We shouldn't have to look forward to this as something that's going to take place years from now. This should be our experience, and it can be. Was that the case with the church in Corinth? Look at the next verse, verse 11. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Thank God there for the house of Chloe, who actually wrote to Paul and told him the problems in Corinth. With what we have learned, the contentions and divisions that were among them what do you think would have, been, would have become about the Lord's Supper? In fact, we know with First Corinthians what had happened. It had lost its power. It lost its significance. It actually had become some kind of a gluttonous feast. It was totally uh, desecrated. And Paul is bringing out here the fact that they were divided. It was they were not fellowshipping with Christ and therefore they were not respecting that ordinance as it should have been. So Paul has to admonish the church. Now he uses the experience of Israel in the wilderness, as an example. Come to chapter 10 now, 1 Corinthians 10. And these are the four verses I'm talking about, that if it wasn't for these four verses that Jesus showed to Paul, I don't think anyone would have ever saw what Paul saw through that experience in the Exodus. We know it because we've read these verses. But try, try think about it as if those verses are not there and imagine seeing what we're going to read. God inspired Paul to write that. And he shows this wonderful parallel with the gospel dispensation with the Christian church. But the most important thing is what we can learn from Israel's failure in that wilderness experience. Let's read 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, then we'll go back through them again, but we'll just read straight through. Moreover, brothers, I would not that you should be ignorant. How about, notice this, all our fathers were under the cloud and all pass through the sea and were all baptised unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat that word meat there simply means food and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ now keep in mind as we go through this passage Paul is addressing the communion service he's leading into it but that's what he's addressing here if you get down to verse 16, which we actually read earlier, 
16 and 17, he goes straight into the communion service. And then you get to chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 20 to 34. The whole lot is about the communion service. So in verse 3 and 4, we just read, did all eat the same spiritual food and did all drink the same spiritual drink? What does that remind you of? What do you think he's talking about there? Clearly the, the emblems of the communion service, the bread and the wine. These first 12 verses, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 12, it's all about Israel's experience in the wilderness through the Exodus on the way to Canaan, the promised land. And they had entered into a covenant with God that they were his professed people. And the, the apostle uses this story as a lesson for the Christian church today to not make the same mistake that they made. For example, look at verse 11. We'll look at it again later, but notice verse 11 with me. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, but they are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the world shall come. So the experience he's about to relate to us now is for our admonition, for our example. Now let's read the first four verses, one at a time, and we'll see how Paul parallels the deliverance of Israel from Egypt with the ordinances of the gospel. Chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brothers, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Of course, this is referring to the exodus from Egypt. And how? How did they come out? How did God deliver them? It says, under the cloud and through the sea. God delivered Israel through his covering, his protection by the cloud and, of course, by parting the sea. Who was it that was in the cloud? that was leading and watching over them, protecting them. Patriarchs and prophets will tell you it was the Son of God who was veiled in the cloudy pillar. In fact, you will read that in verse 4, which is that spiritual rock that followed them. It actually means who went with them was Christ. So that's Christ. It's his presence in the cloud. Who, that cloud went before Israel to guide them and to protect them. God delivered Israel through the covering protection of Christ. Israel was delivered from bondage, the bondage of Egypt, under the watchful care of Jesus, the Son of God. And so too, the parallel with the repentant sinner today, is delivered from the bondage of sin, how? Through the protection, the leading, and the love of Christ, as he guides and draws him to what sin. Let's read verse 2 now. Notice who Moses is a figure of. And all, all Israel, all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. We have Christ in the cloud who is leading and directing his church. And how does he lead and direct his church? Through his appointed ministers. And in this case, it is Moses. Moses is a, is a figure of the, of the minister of the Christian, Christian church who Christ appoints and directs. Here in verse 2, Moses is a figure of God's appointed ministers to the church while Christ is directing Israel in the cloud. It's Moses who's teaching the people of Israel. And all the people are baptised by Moses in the sea. Now we know they weren't baptised. They weren't thinking they were baptism. Back then was not even mentioned in the Old Testament. But Paul is using their passing through the Red Sea under the protection of Christ and through the leading of Moses as a figure of the baptism of the repentant sinner in the Christian church by the appointed minister as Christ leads and directs them. And how was it that the people passed through the Red Sea? Hebrews 11.29 tells you that by faith they passed through the Red Sea. This again is another parallel with the New Testament. As the believer by faith steps into the waters of baptism under the care of God's minister and through the watchful care of Christ above. So too Paul says Israel was baptised by Moses in the sea and under the cloud. Remember what the cloud represented? It was the Son of God who veiled his presence in the cloud. What else does it represent? In John chapter 3, verse 5, remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The sea represents the waters of baptism and the cloud represents the Spirit of God. Paul says, Moses baptized Israel in the cloud and in the sea, paralleling the New Testament believer who is baptised by water and the Spirit. 
Come with me to Exodus chapter 13. Notice what it says about the cloud. How it guided Israel and protected them. Exodus 13 verse 21. Twenty one and twenty two. Well, I just put a few in, but there are so many verses regarding the cloudy pillar. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Notice how that brings out God's faithfulness to Israel and to his church. He took not away the cloud. He took not away his presence from them. Not by day or not by night. He was always there watching over them, always there leading them, always there protecting them. And whose presence was it, as we saw, was the Son of, Son of God. How was his presence manifested to, in the cloud? Isaiah 63. Oh, in fact, sorry, while we're in Exodus, come to chapter 33 of Exodus. Exodus 33. Notice how it was God's divine presence. Exodus 33, verses 9 and 10. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the, floor, at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. The cloudy pillar there, friends, clearly represents the presence of God, his divine presence, as he spoke with Israel, as Moses, and as the people worshipped God there at the tabernacle. How was his presence manifested? Isaiah 63. In that pillar. Of course, we know it's by his spirit, but we're going to read it. Isaiah 63, 11 to 14. Isaiah here recounting the same event. This event is spoken of so many places in the Bible. 11 to 14. Read verse 11 carefully, it's really good. Then he, this is God, then God remembered the days of old. Moses and his people saying, where, where, where is he? And this is God speaking about himself. God is saying to himself, where was I? Where am I? What am I doing? Why, why have I abandoned them? Because they, they had rebelled, if you read the previous verse. But saying, where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? God is reasoning with himself. God is saying to himself, I need to go back to them. I need to go back and protect them and guide them. Where is he that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name? That led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble. As the beast goeth down into the valley, the spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. God's divine presence, friends, was veiled. It was Christ, as we see there. But it was through his divine spirit that he abided in the cloud and that guided his people. So the cloudy pillar represents the spirit of Christ that went before Israel. So Israel's deliverance, the baptism under Moses was all through the direct leading of Christ. Of course, this too is a shadow of the New Testament church, led by Christ and his ministers. What else is the privilege of the New Testament believer? Come back to 1 Corinthians 10 again. Through the communion service, partaking of the bread and the wine. Look what Paul says next. 1 Corinthians 10, let's read verse 3. And they did all, notice here, it keeps emphasizing all. They did all eat the same spiritual food or meat. What was that spiritual food that they all partook of? Book of Exodus, chapter 16. 
Exodus 16 and verse 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, in fact, let's read the previous verse. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as a hoar frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. So this is that spiritual food that they all ate or partook of. And of course, we know what that bread from heaven represented. John chapter 6, Jesus speaking. All these experiences of Israel were all really types and figures of the, of the gospel. The water from the rock, the bread from heaven, the baptism of the sea, the cloudy pillar above, the minister Moses guiding them. John chapter 6, let's read verse 33. What was the bread a symbol of? The bread from heaven. Jesus speaking, For the bread of God is he, is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So here we see clearly Christ telling Believers in his day, or the people in his day, what that bread of heaven really prefigured. Let's read verse 58 now. Same chapter. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So the manna was really just a, a figure of Christ, the true bread of heaven. And look at verse 53. Because also they also drank of that spiritual drink. Verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. He says that four times in the next four verses. Eat his flesh and drink his blood. Now we know what that passage means. We use it often in the communion service. It's not, of course, literal. It's partaking of his life. And his life was a life of self-sacrifice. And that's really important to understand. How can you partake of his life through those emblems and yet you're not sacrificing or surrendering your life to him? It's impossible. We are to eat and drink of the life of Christ. And that's what God was teaching Israel. Did Israel also come back to 1 Corinthians 10? Did Israel also drink of that fountain of life? 1 Corinthians 10, we're up to verse 4 now. They passed through the sea, they were under the, under the cloud. They ate this the spiritual bread, and they did drink that spiritual drink. And all did drink of that same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. And we don't need to go there. If you go to Exodus 17, verse 6, we'll, you read where God, in fact, it was Christ who commanded Moses to strike the rock and out of it flowed living water. And if you come back to John chapter 7 once more, we see that that too, of course, was... A parallel of the Spirit of Christ that comes to the believer. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. When Jesus used these, these terms, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. If any man hunger, let him eat, eat of my body. They knew what he was talking about. In John 6, they say, this is a hard saying, who can bear it? But Sister White told you they knew exactly what he was saying. But they weren't willing to, for that kind of discipleship, that kind of surrender. And so they went away, uh, disappointed. John chapter 7, 37 to 39. In the last day the great, of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man first, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, out of the, as the scripture have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And what did that represent? But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. That's a beautiful lesson in itself. So the Spirit that flowed from the rock was also a symbol of the Spirit of Christ. How many of Israel were privileged, come back to 1 Corinthians 10 now, how many of Israel were privileged to partake of all these blessings 
you read the first four verses, we don't have to read them, but you keep reading it. It says, all the fathers passed, all were baptised under Moses, all did eat the same spiritual food and all did drink that same spiritual drink. So that privilege and that blessing was for everyone and that experience was for everyone. And so it is for the Christian church today, for everyone today. But look, look at verse 5. In spite of that, look at verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now remember this point. Paul is addressing the communion service. That's what he's addressing. That's what he's, that's what he's going towards. Four verses we've read. They all walked in Christ's presence. They all were baptised. They all ate the bread from heaven. They all did drink of that spiritual drink. But what does verse 5 say? With many, God was not well pleased. And they were overthrown in the wilderness. They perished. Many of them, in fact, the majority of them, perished. Why? Even though with all that divine mercies and love of God, why? Verse 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. You see, friends, they departed from Egypt, but they don't, never really left Egypt. Egypt is there as the symbol of the world, material things, etc. They never really, all they did was, they was always lusting after Egypt and the leeks and the onions and the flesh pots and everything else they kept whinging about that they wanted back then. So they were never really converted, even though they partook of these wonderful emblems and God's manifested presence with them. The cloudy pillar would never leave them day or night. And yet with all that divine, miraculous manifestations, they still lusted after evil things. They went through all the forms of the gospel. Like in the last days, we were said earlier in Sabbath school, and you have a form of godliness, but really denying its power therein. They wanted to enter the promised land, but they would not give up their evil heart, which is their sins. They would not give up their sins. The personal presence of Christ, the watchfulness and intercession of Moses, the bread from heaven, the spiritual drink, all those things couldn't save them. Look at 1 Corinthians 10 now. Let's read verse 7 to 10. This lists some of their sins. In fact, we won't read them, but I'll just go through them. Verse 7, idolatry. Verse 8, fornication. Verse 9, tempting Christ. If you go to Numbers 21, you'll read what that one's about. No, we're tempting Christ. They're actually denying God's leading. They're getting angry with Moses. And they were loathing his blessings. They actually said, our soul loatheth this light bread, speaking about the manna. And so tempting Christ... And verse 10, murmuring. And finally, in verse 11, Paul says this, verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, that they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. This whole history was recorded, and the way Paul brings it out, paralleling it with the new Christian church, is for our lesson, friends, that we do not make that same mistake. That's why it's for our admonition. And look what he says now. Verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Despite the manifest tokens of God's love, protection, Israel perished. Partaking of these privileges was no guarantee that Israel would enter the promised land. They did not take heed. Even though they ate the spiritual bread, drank of the spiritual rock, they cherished an evil heart. And that's why Paul, when speaking about those emblems, look what he says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28. Look what he says. How serious a matter it is, the communion service. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You see, Israel partook of all those things in, in the type, not in, in, the, in the truth, in the type. It didn't help them. In fact, those same things ended up condemning them because what more could God do? So Paul says, when we partake of the bread and the wine of these emblems, let a man examine and a woman examine himself first and then let them partake. Could Christ have delivered them from an evil heart? The same way as he delivered them from, from, 
from Egypt. If God can part the Red Sea, if he can give you cloud during the day and fire by night and bring water in the desert and food from heaven, you think he cannot deliver you from an evil heart. Look at verse 13. I love the way... I love the way he puts these verses together. The, 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 the context. He gives you their experience. He tells you about their blessings. And then he tells you that they still lusted and they perished. <clears throat> and God was angry with you. Then he says, If any man think of his stand of take heed, lest he fall. Then he says, These things are written for our admonitions. Now look what he says. Because then the question obviously is, well, why? why? Why couldn't they surrender to him? Look at verse 13. Sorry, verse 12. No, 13, 13. They have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. <clears throat> and especially the next few words, but God is faithful. Remember the cloud that never left them day or night. And the pillar of fire was with them every day, leading them protected. God is faithful. They did not have to succumb to the temptation. There is no temptation taken you, but it's not such that is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able. And with that temptation, offer you a way of escape. You see, friends, those words that have no temptation taken you, such as is common to man, they're a beautiful, beautiful promise. Because what's that saying to you is, <clears throat> as well as with Israel of old, you don't have to fall to whatever that temptation trial is. Because it's not unique to your experience. It's not as if you're going through something that no other man's ever had to face. As such as is common to man. Other men and women have faced similar temptations to yours and worse and they conquered them through faith. And so we cannot, we cannot, we should not believe that we cannot overcome. As the Bible is promising you here. Look what it says. God will not, he's faithful, he will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able and he will give you a way to escape. That you may be able to bear it. For example, say you're tempted with trials, loss of loved ones, loss of health. Look at Job. He lost everything in one day. His family, his loved ones, his health in two days. And you might think, yeah, well, that's Job, but how many other Bible stories is there of people who through wonderful, terrible trials and yet through Christ they were able to overcome that's what it means by it's common to man. You may be, think, be tempted to think that God's asking too much. Look what we studied this morning about Abraham. Who of us has been asked to sacrifice our own children? So there is no temptation that is not common to man, friends. You may be tempted or being persecuted for your faith. Look at the martyrs throughout the whole Christian dispensation till this very day. Look at the Waldensis. And they're not all Abrahams and Jobs. Simple people. Just faithful men and women and children who remain firm and faithful to God regardless of the persecution, even to martyrdom. And so that verse means what it says, that God is faithful and not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able. No temptation can come to you that is not common to man. And most of all, friends, that applies to Jesus. For he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. God could have delivered them friends, from the last of an evil heart, idolatry of the world. What was really the problem with Israel in the wilderness is verse 6 tells you there, they lusted after evil things. And the way Paul puts this together, what he's trying to show us and what God was trying to show Israel was, he delivered them from Egypt through the plagues and his judgments. He parted the Red Sea. He rained bread from heaven. He flowed living water out of, the, out of the desert rock. He gave them a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, etc. All these divine miracles, God's power, was to show them in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God is faithful and that he, he was able to deliver them from the temptation and from the things they were lasting after. And Paul says these things are written for our admonition. We as a church have experienced God's blessings. We've experienced baptism, many of us. We partake of the communion ordinances. But can these things guarantee us of entering into the heavenly Canaan? They didn't guarantee Israel. 
Remember what God says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. This is a very important verse, this one. Many men have fallen at this verse. My experience as a Christian for sadly too short a time, but some 20 years, but for one thing I've really learnt is that confidence is probably the worst thing you can have. I'm talking about confidence in the flesh. Some, that will surely bring you down. There's times when it's happened to me, and it's probably happened to all of you at different times. When you're on such a, such a walk with Christ where you feel almost indestructible and, and, and God shows you things. and It's a wonderful experience. And sometimes that can, you get a little bit cocky. And it's happened to me up here and I did say one that I wish I could have sunk underneath the disappeared. Because the words that don't come anymore. God's showing you. He, he, and he does it sometimes. He humbles you and you don't forget it. Let a man that think of his stand of take heed. Israel thought they could stand. They thought that God would deliver them and bring them all the way in heavenly Canaan, yet they perished in the wilderness. And so we go through baptism, we go through the communion service. And the same admonition is for us, with the take heed. You know what confidence leads to? It leads to presumption. And we know what presumption is. Why does the Bible say work out your own salvation with what? With confidence? With fear, trembling. Now to have boldness, to have courage, these are wonderful qualities. Paul was courageous. Stephen was bold. Look at Peter before the Sanhedrin, how bold he was. But look at Peter a short time previous when he said, all these will betray you but not I, will deny you but not I. And yet he denied him that very night before a woman. And, Paul, and Peter was brave. But when that was confidence in the flesh, friends, and it got him nowhere, but when he was humbled, when he was converted, then he could stand before the whole Sanhedrin and he could speak words that they couldn't believe that he could speak. You know, um, when he says to them, whether it be right in the sight of God to obey thee, judge ye, for we cannot speak but of the things we've seen and heard. They just threatened him not to speak in Christ's name anymore, and he said that to them. I cannot but speak in the things that I've seen and heard. That's courage and boldness, but that's, they're qualities that come from God when you're humble. So we've got to be wary of that one. Paul had no confidence in the flesh. That's Philippians 3, verse 3, at all. And that same chapter, verse 11, he says that I might attain unto the... If anyone, if anybody ever lived who should have been certain that they're going to heaven, it should have been the Apostle Paul. And yet he says that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Only friends, when he knew martyrdom was coming, could he say, there's a crown left, left for me. I finished my course and kept the faith. He never said that earlier. Because you can be victorious today and you can fall tomorrow, especially if you're thinking you're victorious. And so that's something we need to guard against about taking heed to think we can stand. Lest we fall. Come to Hebrews 3 now. This is the same story. Paul relates this story more than any other New Testament writer and the, the lessons he gives from it. Hebrews 3 and 4 is the same. Hebrews 3, let's read verse 10. This is God is speaking. Very similar to what we read in 1 Corinthians 10. Hebrews 3.10. God says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation. And that's Israel. And God says, They do always err in their heart. And they have not known my ways. Remember 1 Corinthians 10.5? With many God was not well pleased. That's what he's saying here. He was grieved with that generation. They always err in their heart. And he says, They have not known my ways. No generation had ever lived who had more, greater witness of God's divine power and his ways than, than Israel, like we've been seeing. The judgments, the plagues, the parting of the sea, etc. And yet God says, they have not known my ways. In fact, look at the previous verse, look at verse 9. When your fathers, well let's read from verse 8. Harder not your heart, hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. They saw God's works, they saw his ways for 40 years. And yet God says they have not known my ways. You see, friends, it wasn't just the physical manifestations of God's protection and power. God wanted to change their heart. That's where the problem was. We saw in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, they lusted after evil things. 
That's what he wanted to change. And that, by the way, is the greatest miracle God performs in the universe. It's not speaking things into existence. It's not keeping the planets and the stars in their orbit. It's changing a, repent, a, a sinner to a righteous person. Because he cannot do that without your will. You have to cooperate with him in that. God wanted to change their hearts, friends. He wanted to give them rest. Look at, look at chapter 4, verse 1 of Hebrews. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, never you should seem to come short of it like Israel did. He wanted to bring them into his rest. That promised land was a symbol of God's rest, rest, rest from sin, peace with God and with one another. Rest from your enemies, rest from yourself. That's what he was trying to change. And he has the power to do so because we read in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation can come upon you but such as is common to man and God is faithful. He could have delivered them. But you see, Israel did not know God's ways for they did not want to know God's ways. They des desired physical deliverance. They wanted to enter Canaan with all their selfishness, idolatry and memory. They wanted God's protection. They wanted his blessings. But they wanted to remain as they were. That's why he says they do always err in their heart. They did not want to know God's ways. They did not want to enter into his rest. Of course, not all Israel was lost. Come to Numbers 14. And this too is a good lesson for us because there, are, there were faithful ones. Numbers 14. Speaking about Caleb. Let's read from verse 22 to 24. Because all those men which have seen my glory, notice, and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, in spite of all that, and have tempted me now, these, God was counting these ten times, and I have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and have followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land where we run to. He went, and his seed shall possess it. So there was many who were unfaithful with whom God was not pleased, who lusted over the evil heart and evil things. And there were some, like Caleb, whose God's spirit was in him, who allowed God to change and transform them. And they went in. And that's again a parallel for us, friends, for the last days, the Christian church. There's going to be lots of murmurers, and idolaters, and there's only going to be a few Caleb's that are going into the heavenly Canaan. An important point regarding the communion service, that's often overlooked, by the way, that we're going to look at now quickly. When we partake of the bread and the wine, emblems of Christ's broken body and his spilled blood, that, of course, reminds us of our forgiveness. His suffering and death brought our forgiveness from, of sins. And that, of course, brings forth gratitude. We partake of that with gratitude, knowing that Christ has paid for our sins and justified us. It gives us peace, joy, and we also look forward to... We partake of those emblems until his, his coming. So we look forward to his second coming. So that's beautiful. But, friends, we also have to recognise when we partake of them emblems that it's because of our sins that he had to suffer and die, that his body was broken and he had to spill his blood. So uh, although that brings forth gratefulness, which is good, and joy for the second coming, it should also bring forth remorse and sorrow. It should remind you of that because it was your sins and mine that caused his suffering and death. So yes, there's joy, there's peace with God, there's the hope of the second coming, the resurrection. And there's also sorrow and remorse that my sins cause him to suffer and die. Now this is a very serious matter because if one partakes of those emblems and you're still committing sin, instead of receiving forgiveness, you're condemned as guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. You see how serious it is? Look at 1 Corinthians 10, sorry, 11, verse 27. Now. Look how serious it is. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. Look how the Apostle puts it now. 
The communion service and partaking of those emblems is the most wonderful privilege a Christian can have and the greatest blessing for them and for the church. But, verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Paul wrote that, friends, not me. You partake, and unworthily means that you're living in sin. That's a, don't listen to these new age, what is not new age, new theology for your agents want to tweet us something rubbish. That's what it means exactly what it's saying. Unworthily means that you're living in sin. You're not right with God. And you partake of them emblems, you're guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. You know what it's saying? It's saying that you're guilty for having crucified him. You're with Caiaphas and Pilate and the rest of them and the chief priest. That's exactly what it's saying. I'm not twisting it. So you're either numbered with those who are forgiven and you're blessed, or you're numbered with those who crucified him. That's what 1 Corinthians 11, 27 is saying. And that's why Paul says in the next verse, verse 28, wait, eight, that we read earlier, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. That's why he puts that warning there. Final point, we're finishing up. Should a believer exclude themselves from communion because they feel unworthy or something that they did during the week, something wrong that they did during the week, for example? And this is a question that's often asked. Notice with me now the condition of the disciples in the very night when Christ instituted these two ordinances. It's from the Desire of Ages. These men were totally unconverted, friends, that night. The glances they cast upon each other told of jealousy and contention. There was strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? Remember, James and John wanted to be at Jesus' left and right hand. And Judas was the most angry of all with them and he actually pushed his way in between them. This contention carried on in the presence of Christ grieved and wounded him. When the disciples entered the, the supper room, their hearts were full of resentful feelings. Just prior to this, Jesus had told them that they saw Jesus, his whole countenance was changed. He, was, he knew what was coming that evening. And he was, his whole concerns were for his disciples. And he had told them, they saw that he, his, whole, his whole character was different, that he was concerned, that he was worried, etc. And, and yet there was still contention among them instead of con- con- being concerned for him. And that's why she says that wounded him so much. Notice who else was there receiving the emblems of the communion service. Judas the betrayer was present at the sacramental service. He received from Jesus the emblems of his broken body and spilled blood. He heard the words, this do in remembrance of me. And sitting there in the very presence of the Lamb of God, the betrayer brooded upon his own dark purposes and cherished his sullen, revengeful thoughts. Friends, Jesus offered the bread and the wine to Judas. Jesus washed Judas' Judas' feet. In fact, he washed his feet first. And he offered him the emblems. And you're concerned about something that happened during the week. Now, I I don't mean by that, don't don't understand me. I don't mean that you live in the world, and then a week before communion you start getting right with God, and then you might have a slip-up, and then... You can still have communion. I'm not saying that at all. You've got to be right with God. We just saw what it means by eating it unworthily. You're guilty of crucifying Christ. But don't allow Satan to take advantage and keep you from not having a communion service because of something you've done. He's offering it to Judas. Judas had prior to that twice already gone to meet the priest to betray Jesus. He'd already sealed the deal. And Christ, of course, knows that. He told them that night that one of you will betray me, etc., not all of you were clean, he told them after he washed their feet. And yet he offered the emblems to him. Of course, on the, because he was trying to draw him to repentance, of course. Jesus washed Judas' feet and he offered him the bread and the wine. Again, notice this. Notice the type of spirit they had. With the spirit they then had, not one of them was prepared for communion with Christ. Until, brought into a state of humility and love, they were not prepared to partake of the Paschal Supper or to share in a memorial service which Christ was about to institute. Their hearts must be cleansed. Pride and self-seeking create dissension and hatred. But all this Jesus washed away in washing their feet. You know, for me, this is without doubt the greatest lesson he taught, without a doubt for me. 
the, the, the wisdom of God sometimes. For three and a half years of his teaching, of the miracles that they witnessed, of all the things he did, raising the dead, etc., feeding the 5,000 with some loaves and fishes, all the miracles he did, healing the sick, casting out demons. And for me, the greatest thing he taught was when he never said a word. I just watched their feet. And she says there, pride and self-seeking create dissension and hatred, but all this Jesus washed away in washing their feet. He, just when Satan seemed to have the victory over Christ's disciples and the very eve of his betrayal and crucifixion, Christ snatches the victory back with an act of love and humility. The creator of the world is bent down to wash the feet of his disciples. Now there was union of heart, love for one another. They had become humble and teachable. You see, friends, now they're ready. And that's what the pre- preparatory service is for. They were ready now to partake. Except that Judas. Each was ready to concede to another the highest place. There was no longer contention about who receives the highest place. Though Jesus knew Judas from the beginning, he washed his feet. And the betrayer was privileged to unite with Christ in partaking of the sacrament. A long-suffering saviour held out every inducement for the sinner to receive him, to repent, and to be cleansed from the defilement of sin. This example is for us. When we suppose one to be in error and sin, we are not to divorce ourselves from him. I had to shorten this, but I really recommend you read that. It's really good. This is not Christ's method. It was because the disciples were erring and faulty that he washed their feet. And all but one of the twelve was fast brought to repentance. And as we saw previously, they were ready to partake of the supper. So friends, it's not just the previous week where we had to make preparation. That is true. Studying of the Bible through fasting, meditation, etc. Prayerful meditation. These are all things we, we do. That's why we always announce this communion service the week before. But as I said earlier, people have asked me, if, if someone holds back from partaking because they were not pleased with something they did during the week, don't let that exclude you. you you've got to make it right, of course. But that's what Christ is there for. You know? It was because they were erring and faulty that he washed their feet. And that preparatory service of washing the feet is all part of that. As I said earlier, of course, if you follow the correct um, the correct conditions, the gospel, of course, and you make that right with God or someone, whatever. If the heart is repentant of true godly sorrow, then Satan shouldn't let the devil take advantage of that. That's what the service is meant for, to prepare each other for the communion. If you still feel unworthy for something that you've already confessed and repented of, then how is allowing more time to pass going to make that better? You know, E.J. Wagon, he actually talks about that very thing. Some people, they do something wrong and they've probably done it so many times, that same thing, and they, they just can't pray, they can't ask God to forgive them, they feel so guilty. That, in some ways, is not bad, but the, but the reality, the truth is, God already knew it anyway, friends. And you have to believe he's faithful to forgive you and, and to keep you from sinning, from doing that again. And allowing time to pass, that's just legalism. That's so you feel, you feel better about it before you ask God to forgive you. So you're actually no better off. We're told the moment we sin, we should confess it and make it right with God. And then believe you're forgiven. That's what faith is all about, to believe it. And then you can partake of the service. You're not going to get better as more time passes and maybe confess it in two weeks' time. It's not going to help. But friends, if you're not right with God, if you're still in Egypt, and I don't mean you're robbing banks. Each one of us, we know what it means. Don't even consider partaking of this. Because 1 Corinthians 11, 27 tells you, you're bringing, verse 28 tells you you're bringing damnation upon yourself. It's a serious matter. And so the greatest blessing we have that will unite the church, bring it unto a perfect man, and finish the work of the gospel, is all pretty community service. That's why Satan sought to destroy it during, during the dark ages when the Reformation was bringing that truth back. Um, especially people like the Anabaptists and others who were really fighting for the communion service and the, uh, the uh, uh, what are they called? I forgot they called these other people. They were like the Anabaptists as well. Anyway, so 
as we prepare for ordinances next Sabbath. And we have this following this week ahead of us to spend time in God's word and prayer, being faithful in the things we do. We saw that nice video earlier about the ministry there, the, the music, etc. I just want the church to understand that we have lost the power that service is supposed to represent. And to deny that is, is, is actually evidence that we've lost the power. Because if we hadn't, then there would be a work happening here and in the world which would be truly explosive. And it's not happening. So we're still struggling individually and as a body. When we understand what the community service is about, surrender to God, leave Egypt behind, truly live for him, his Christ will become ours individually and as a body. And the church will come to a perfect man. And the work will be finished. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee, Lord, for your word. We thank thee for this wonderful service that Jesus instituted that is to really empower, bless and unite the church. And we know, Lord, that this will be realised. And we pray that we can be a part of that. And we know the only thing hindering this is ourselves. Help us to be faithful to understand and to know thy ways, unlike Israel. To leave behind anything in our lives that is hindering the life of Christ to be lived out in us. Help us to partake of his body and of his blood. To truly receive his life. To sacrifice in this life that we may have the self-sacrificing life of Christ lived out in us. That we may truly, like Caleb, be found to be faithful. That your spirit may dwell in us. And we may enter into the promised land and receive the admonition that Paul wrote for us. We pray and we thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen.